I hesitated for a moment, my thumb hovering over the answer button, before finally mustering up the courage to pick up. Hello? I said, my voice trembling with a mixture of fear and curiosity. There was a long pause on the other end of the line, so long that I started to wonder if maybe it was just a wrong number or something. But then, just when I was about to hang up, I heard it, a low, raspy voice whispering my name. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest as the voice spoke again, this time louder and more insistent. I know who you are, it said, sending a shiver down my spine. I know what you've done. Night shift at the gas station, Charlie. I have never returned to that place, and I pray I never will. Working the night shift at the gas station isn't always a thrill, but I needed the extra cash. It was quiet, mostly. A few cars passing through, the hum of the overhead lights, and the low buzz of the refrigerators. But tonight was different. As I stood behind the counter, scanning magazines that no one would buy, a feeling of unease crept over me. My skin prickled with an inexplicable dread, and a chill ran down my spine. I glanced out the window, the empty parking lot seemed darker than usual. That's when I first noticed him. A man, tall and thin, standing beneath a flickering streetlight. He was just staring at the gas station, unmoving. I tried to shake off the feeling, chalking it up to my imagination running wild. But every time I looked up the window, he was still there, never taking his eyes off the store. I figured he was just waiting for a friend, so I continued with my work, trying to ignore him. Hours passed, and the occasional customer came and went. But the man remained. I couldn't help but watch him from behind the counter. He was so still, like a statue. The fluorescent lights above me hummed, casting eerie shadows on the shelves. Around 2 a.m., things took a turn for the worse. The power flickered, and then, everything went dark. Panic set in as I fumbled for my phone, using its weak flashlight to navigate the store. I was alone, and the night seemed to close in around me. I heard a faint scraping sound, like fingernails on glass, coming from the front door. My heart raced as I crept towards the noise. When I shone my light on the glass door, I saw what caused the sound. The man was scratching at the glass, his face contorted into a twisted grin. My breath caught in my throat, and I stumbled backward, falling over a display of chips. I fumbled to my feet, my phone's light trembling as I pointed it towards the door. But he was gone. The man had disappeared into the darkness. Terrified and unsure of what to do, I decided to call the police. I locked myself in the manager's office, trembling as I recounted the strange events to the dispatcher. They assured me that an officer would be on their way, and I should stay put. As I waited, the feeling of dread only intensified. The shadows in the office seemed to come alive, dancing and writhing in the dim light. I heard whispers, faint and barely distinguishable. It was as if the night itself was trying to communicate with me. Time passed in a blur, and I was startled when a knock on the office door broke the silence. I cautiously opened it, relieved to see a police officer. He was a middle-aged man with a reassuring presence. I quickly explained the situation, and he assured me that he would check the area. I watched as he left the office, his flashlight casting eerie beams of light through the darkness. But moments later, he returned, his face pale. He told me that there was no sign of the man outside and that it was probably just a prank. Despite his words, I could tell he was unnerved. The officer said he would stay with me until my shift ended, just to be safe. 
As we sat in the office, the feeling of unease persisted. We heard strange noises coming from the gas pumps, like distant whispers and faint laughter. The officer suggested it might be the wind, but there was no wind that night. Time ticked by slowly, and the officer's radio crackled to life with a garbled message. He responded, and a look of confusion crossed his face. He told me he needed to go check something and would be back shortly. I watched as he left the office once more, leaving me alone in the eerie darkness. As I stood there in the flickering light of the gas station, my heart pounding, I realized the police officer hadn't returned. The silence that had fallen over the gas station was suffocating, broken only by the faint hum of the refrigerators and the distant whispers that seemed to emanate from nowhere. Fear and dread gnawed at me as I contemplated the officer's absence. Should I wait for him, or should I leave the gas station on my own? I knew I couldn't stay there any longer. It felt like the very walls of the store were closing in on me, suffocating me. Gathering what little courage I had left, I decided to step out of the office once more and find out what had happened to the officer. The harsh fluorescent lights revealed the empty store, devoid of any signs of life. I made my way to the glass door, where the officer had last stood. With a sense of impending doom, I peered outside. There, under the flickering streetlight, lay the police officer's flashlight, abandoned on the ground. Panic coursed through me as I picked it up, realizing something was terribly wrong. The officer had left behind his only source of light, a lifeline in the oppressive darkness. I called out for him, but my voice echoed through the empty parking lot. There was no response. The gas station was surrounded by an eerie stillness, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something malevolent lurked in the shadows. Summoning all my courage, I ventured out into the night, clutching the flashlight like a lifeline. The cold air stung my skin as I cautiously made my way towards the flickering streetlight. My heart raced with each step, and the anxiety of the unknown gripped me like a vice. Under the wavering light, I saw something that sent a chill through my bones. A trail of dark, wet footprints led away from the gas station and disappeared into the distance. They were eerie and inexplicable, as if something had dragged itself along the ground. I followed the unsettling trail, my flashlight cutting through the oppressive darkness. The anxiety and fear welled up within me, and I couldn't help but feel that I was walking into a nightmare. The whispers grew louder, more distinct, but their origin remained elusive. As I continued to trace the trail of footprints, I suddenly came upon the police officer's radio, discarded on the ground. The realization hit me like a sledgehammer, something had happened to him. But what? My mind raced with terrifying possibilities. Was the wet footprint blood? I didn't want to find out. I called out for the officer again, my voice trembling with fear. But there was still no response, only the haunting whispers that seemed to swirl around me. I felt a growing sense of dread, a suffocating fear that I was being watched and followed. With my heart in my throat, I reached a desolate clearing on the outskirts of the gas station property. And there, I finally discovered the source of the trail, a gaping hole in the ground, like a dark, foreboding abyss. It seemed to go on forever, and ever, and I couldn't see the bottom. Leaving the pit behind, I hurried back to my car, my heart pounding so hard. I sped away from the gas station, my thoughts consumed by the inexplicable events of that night. Days passed since that terrifying night at the gas station. The memory of the inexplicable events continued to haunt me, keeping me awake at night. I also wondered what had happened to the police officer. I was then contacted by the local police department for an investigation. The officer had been found, but not in the way I had hoped. He was discovered in a remote, 
desolate area near the gas station, brutally murdered. Shock filled every inch of my being. The news was devastating, and I couldn't help but blame myself for his fate. The guilt of not doing more to help him weighed heavily on my conscience. I cooperated with the police in their investigation, providing them with all the information I could about the man I had seen that night. But as the investigation progressed, it became clear that the man had left no traces, no clues to his identity or his motives. The police were no closer to catching him than I was. The trauma of that night changed me. I became plagued by nightmares, the whispers and the pit haunting my sleep. It left me forever scarred, a prisoner of my own fear. And to this day, the man remains at large, a specter that lurks in the darkness, waiting for his next victim. The gas station, with its eerie presence, stands as a grim reminder of the horrors I witnessed. I have never returned to that place, and I pray I never will. The Faded Connection, Lewis Life was going on as usual, birds singing, sun shining, nothing out of the ordinary. But then, things took a turn that I never saw coming. I started feeling like someone was following me, a constant shadow in the background. The days rolled by, and this eerie feeling intensified. Every step I took, every corner I turned, I couldn't shake off the sensation that someone, something, lurked just a breath away, always a few steps behind, like a silent ghost in my personal space. It messed with my head, made me question my own sanity. Nighttime became the worst, I heard footsteps in the dark, and see shadows that didn't belong. Was I hallucinating? I tried telling my friends, but they shrugged it off saying it was just stress and my imagination. The police didn't take it seriously without any evidence. So, there I was, alone with this silent stalker, a feeling of being watched that I couldn't shake. Desperate, I set up security cameras, hoping to catch a glimpse of this mystery stalker. Night after night, I'd watch the footage, hoping to see who was turning my life into a twisted puzzle. And then, the plot twisted in a way I never expected. As I reviewed the footage, I saw a figure that froze my blood, it was none other than me. The stalker, the one who had invaded my life, looked exactly like me. I thought it was a glitch, a mistake, but the evidence was staring me in the face. I was being hunted by my own reflection. The world turned upside down. How could I be stalking myself? Was it a sick joke my mind was playing on me? Was I really hallucinating? So, there I was, face to face with my doppelganger, ready to unravel the mystery that had turned my life into a crazy puzzle. I looked them in the eyes, demanding answers. But you know what? They just stayed silent, like a stone wall reflecting my confusion and fear right back at me. It felt like a mind game, a real psychological showdown. Imagine staring into a mirror, expecting some answers, but all you get is your own reflection staring back, with emptiness. It was like a battle inside my own head, a crazy fight where the enemy was basically myself. The air got thick with tension, and every second felt like a ticking time bomb waiting for someone to spill the beans. But nope, just eerie silence hanging in the air. Just then they disappeared into the shadows, just like that. So, when I went digging for the truth, I stumbled upon a family secret that rocked my world. Turns out, I had an identical twin, long lost and separated from me since birth. Now, you'd think a reunion with a twin would be a happy thing, right? Not in my case. This twin of mine had some seriously shady plans. They weren't here for a heartwarming family reunion. They wanted to do a total takeover of my life. I'm talking about stepping into my shoes and trying to erase me from existence, like I was some kind of unwanted draft on their life story. Crazy, right? 
life started going downhill real quick. My evil twin decided to play copycat, mimicking every single thing I did like some kind of twisted game. Picture looking into a mirror, but instead of seeing yourself, you see a version tainted with pure nastiness. It sent shivers down my spine, let me tell you. Suddenly, it wasn't just about weird coincidences anymore. It became this intense mind game, like a battle for my very existence. We were at war, but not with fists, it was all in our heads. Every move, every thought, felt like a piece in this crazy chess game where the stakes were way higher than I could even wrap my head around. I was just a pawn in this psychological battlefield, and let me tell you, it was way more terrifying than any physical fight. I couldn't take this anymore. I confronted them again and they punched me. I didn't hold back, I gave them the strongest blow I could punch as flying, words exchanged like artillery. It wasn't just about who could throw a better punch, it was a full-on war for who we really were deep down. In the middle of all the chaos, I caught a glimpse of something twisted in my twin's eyes, satisfaction. It was like they were getting a kick out of the whole thing, reveling in the chance to wipe me off the map. This fight wasn't just physical, it was a full-on soul showdown, a battle to decide who would come out on top. It felt like the stakes were higher than ever, and the room echoed with the sound of a fight that went beyond just fists and kicks. Summoning up every ounce of determination, I fought back. It was punch after punch, move after move, a real showdown to prove I wasn't about to let the darkness win. The room turned into a battlefield, a crazy canvas painted with our struggle. When it all boiled down to those last moments, I somehow managed to come out on top. I overpowered my evil twin, their whole nasty plan crumbled to bits. I stood there, yeah, victorious, but not without my fair share of scars. The police got involved, investigations took place, it was all so messy. As the dust settled, I faced the reality of the twisted relationship with my twin. The battle was won, but the scars ran deep. I couldn't erase the fact that the person who had tried to take over my life looked exactly like me. The Kidnapper, Rin I want to share a story that happened to me not too long ago. It was a regular evening, and I was walking home alone after a late shift at work. The streets were quiet, and the only sound was the echo of my footsteps on the pavement. As I neared my apartment building, I felt this uneasy sensation, like someone was watching me. I brushed it off, thinking it was just my imagination playing tricks on me. But the feeling persisted, and I quickened my pace. Suddenly, I heard footsteps behind me, and my heart started to race. I turned around, but there was no one in sight. I convinced myself it was paranoia, but the footsteps continued, growing closer and more menacing. Panicked, and I broke into a run, as fast as I could. Before I could reach the safety of my apartment, I saw a figure emerging from the darkness, grabbing me forcefully. A cloth covered my nose and mouth, and everything went pitch black. When I regained consciousness, I found myself in a dimly lit room, tied to a chair. My mouth was covered with tape. I looked at the kidnapper in fear. He had his face covered in a black mask. After noticing that I was awake, he spoke in a chilling voice about his obsession with me, recounting details of my life that no stranger should know. As minutes turned into hours, the situation became increasingly dire. The kidnapper seemed unhinged, and I feared for my life. He mockingly asked if I needed food. I nodded in fear. He went somewhere after that. I thought of escaping, and I struggled against the restraints. I remember learning survival skills at school and I somehow managed to loosen the ropes just enough to free myself. With stealth and desperation, I crept through the shadows, avoiding any sound that might betray my escape. 
Thankfully, I didn't encounter the kidnapper. I reached the door and slipped away into the night. I ran as fast as my trembling legs could carry me, not stopping until I reached the safety of a nearby store. Terrified and traumatized, I called the police and shared my horrifying ordeal. The experience changed me forever, leaving scars that go beyond the physical. I still have the fear of being watched and pursued, it is a haunting reminder of the night I narrowly escaped a fate that could have been far worse. It was one of those nights where the rain was coming down in buckets, turning the world outside into a blurry mess of shadows and mist. I was just chilling at home, trying to keep myself occupied while the storm raged on outside. As the hours passed, I started to feel this weird sense of unease creeping over me. It was like the storm itself was alive, pulsing with some kind of dark energy that seemed to seep into every corner of my house. I tried to shake it off, to convince myself that it was just my imagination running wild, but deep down I knew something wasn't right. And then, just when I thought things couldn't get any weirder, they did. I started hearing strange noises coming from outside, faint whispers carried on the wind, eerie laughter echoing through the darkness. At first I tried to ignore them, to convince myself that they were just figments of my imagination. But the longer I listened, the more convinced I became that something was seriously wrong. I tried to distract myself, to focus on something, anything, other than the strange noises outside. But no matter what I did, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that something sinister was lurking just beyond the rain-soaked windows of my house. And then, just when I thought I couldn't take it anymore, the power went out. I stumbled around in the darkness, my heart pounding in my chest as I tried to find a flashlight or a candle or anything that could help me see. As I fumbled through the darkness, I heard something. A faint tapping sound coming from somewhere outside. I froze, my breath catching in my throat as I strained to listen. It sounded like someone was tapping on the window, trying to get my attention. I approached the window cautiously, my heart racing with fear and anticipation. And when I finally reached it, I saw something that made my blood run cold. There, standing in the rain, was a figure tall and shadowy with glowing eyes that seemed to pierce right through me. I stumbled backward, my mind reeling with fear and confusion as I tried to make sense of what I was seeing. But before I could react, the figure vanished into the darkness, leaving me standing there alone in the storm. I tried to tell myself that it was just my imagination playing tricks on me, that there was nothing out there but the rain and the wind. But deep down, I knew better. I spent the rest of the night huddled in my bed, the sound of the storm raging on outside like some kind of twisted lullaby. And as I drifted off to sleep, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. When I woke up the next morning, the storm had passed, leaving behind nothing but a faint drizzle and a lingering sense of dread. I tried to tell myself that it was all just a bad dream, that there was nothing to be afraid of. But deep down, I knew that the horror of that rainy night would stay with me forever. A reminder that some nightmares can only happen when the rain is falling and the world is cloaked in darkness. Alright, let me tell you about the night that still sends shivers down my spine whenever I think about it. It was one of those dark and stormy nights, you know, the kind where the rain is coming down in sheets and the wind is howling like some kind of angry beast. I was just chilling at home, trying to relax after a long day at work, when suddenly out of nowhere my phone rang. I didn't recognize the number, but something about it sent a chill down my spine. I hesitated for a moment, my thumb hovering over the answer button, before finally mustering up the courage to pick up. Hello? I said, 
my voice trembling with a mixture of fear and curiosity. There was a long pause on the other end of the line, so long that I started to wonder if maybe it was just a wrong number or something. But then, just when I was about to hang up, I heard it, a low, raspy voice whispering my name. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest as the voice spoke again, this time louder and more insistent. I know who you are, it said, sending a shiver down my spine. I know what you've done. I tried to respond, to ask who was calling or what they wanted from me, but before I could get a word out, the line went dead. I stared at my phone in disbelief, my mind racing with a million different thoughts and fears. Was it just a prank call? Some kind of sick joke from one of my friends? Or was there something more sinister at play? Something lurking in the shadows, just waiting for the perfect moment to strike? I tried to shake off the feeling of dread that had settled over me like a dark cloud. But no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was seriously wrong. I paced back and forth in my living room, my nerves on edge as I tried to make sense of what had just happened. Was I being watched, followed? Was someone out there, lurking in the darkness, just waiting for the perfect moment to strike? I tried to tell myself that it was just my imagination running wild, that there was nothing to be afraid of. But deep down, I knew that wasn't true. There was something out there, something sinister and malevolent, and it was coming for me. I tried to call the police, to tell them about the strange phone call and the feeling of dread that had settled over me like a dark cloud. But when I picked up the phone, I realized that it was dead, completely dead, no dial tone, no nothing. I felt a cold chill run down my spine as I realized what that meant. Whoever had called me, whoever was out there in the darkness, they weren't playing games. They were serious, deadly serious, and they were coming for me. I tried to think of a plan, of something, anything, that could help me escape from whatever nightmare was unfolding around me. But no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't shake the feeling of impending doom that hung over me like a dark cloud. And then, just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, I heard it. A faint scratching sound coming from outside. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest, as the sound grew louder and louder like something trying to claw its way into the house. I stumbled backward, my mind racing with fear and confusion as I tried to make sense of what was happening. Was it an animal, a person, or something even more sinister, something that defied explanation? I didn't stick around to find out. With a sense of dread gnawing at my insides, I made a run for it, desperate to escape from whatever horror was lurking in the darkness outside. And as I fled into the night, the rain pounding down around me like a symphony of dread, I couldn't help but wonder, would I ever escape from the nightmare that had suddenly become my reality? Or was I doomed to spend the rest of my days running, always one step behind the darkness that pursued me? The Red Deception Let me tell you about the unsettling events that unfolded in my life when I discovered my roommate had been stealing my blood. It all started innocently enough, or so I thought, but what I uncovered would plunge me into a nightmare I never could have imagined. I moved into a small apartment in the heart of the city about six months ago. Rent prices were skyrocketing, and finding a place within my budget seemed like a stroke of luck. My roommate, Alex, seemed friendly and easygoing, and we quickly settled into a comfortable routine. But as the weeks went by, I started to notice some strange occurrences. I'd wake up in the middle of the night feeling weak and dizzy, my body drained of energy as if something was sapping the life out of me. At first, I brushed it off as stress or lack of sleep, but as the symptoms persisted, I began to grow suspicious. Then, one day, I stumbled upon something that sent a chill down my spine. A small vial of blood hidden in the back of Alex's closet. At first, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. 
Why would Alex have a vial of blood, and why was it hidden away like some dark secret? I confronted Alex about it, hoping for a reasonable explanation. But what I got instead was a string of excuses and half-truths. He claimed it was for a medical condition, something he didn't want to burden me with. But deep down, I knew there was more to the story. I couldn't shake the feeling that Alex was hiding something from me, something dark and sinister that lurked beneath the surface. But try as I might, I couldn't find any concrete evidence to support my suspicions. Then, one night, I woke up to find Alex standing over me, a crazed look in his eyes as he brandished a syringe filled with blood. Before I could react, he plunged the needle into my arm, drawing out a vial's worth of blood with practiced ease. I screamed and struggled against him, but he was too strong, pinning me down with a strength that belied his slender frame. And then, just as suddenly as he had appeared, he was gone, leaving me alone in the darkness with nothing but the echo of his laughter ringing in my ears. I lay there for what felt like hours, my mind reeling with shock and disbelief. How could Alex do this to me? What did he want with my blood? And what was he planning to do with it? I knew I had to get out of there, to escape from Alex and whatever twisted game he was playing. But as I stumbled to my feet and made my way to the door, I felt a sudden wave of dizziness wash over me, the world spinning out of control as my vision blurred and darkness closed in around me. And then, just as suddenly as it had begun, the darkness lifted, and I found myself standing in the middle of the woods, with no memory of how I'd gotten there or what had happened to me. I stumbled through the trees, my heart pounding in my chest, my mind racing with fear and uncertainty. And then, just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, I saw it. A figure emerging from the shadows, its eyes gleaming with malice as it advanced towards me with slow, deliberate steps. I tried to run, to flee from the nightmare unfolding before me, but it was no use. The figure was everywhere, its presence looming over me like a dark cloud that threatened to swallow me whole. And then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, the figure vanished into the darkness, leaving me alone in the woods with nothing but the echo of its laughter ringing in my ears. I stumbled forward, my body racked with exhaustion and fear as I realized the truth. Alex had been stealing my blood, not for medical reasons, but for something far more sinister. And now, I was trapped in a nightmare from which there was no escape, with no one to help me and no way to find my way back home. Let me tell you about the roommate from hell. It all began innocently enough. I had just graduated from college, excited to embark on my new job and the next phase of my life. Needing a place to stay, I met Joseph. At first glance, Joseph seemed like the ideal roommate, friendly, outgoing, and always ready to lend a hand. We hit it off instantly, and before long we were signing a lease together for a cozy apartment in the heart of the city. However, as time passed, I began to notice peculiarities about Joseph's subtle shifts in behavior that set off alarms in the recesses of my mind. He would return home late at night, his clothes disheveled, offering vague excuses about working late or spending time with friends. Initially, I dismissed these occurrences, attributing them to the stress of our new jobs and the demands of urban life. But deep down, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss, that there was more to Joseph than met the eye. Then one fateful night, I stumbled upon the chilling truth. Returning home early from work, I heard hushed voices emanating from Joseph's room, voices eerily reminiscent of the shady characters I'd seen loitering around our building after dark. Intrigued, I inched closer to the door, straining to decipher their conversation. Initially, their words eluded me, but as I concentrated, the fragments coalesced into a harrowing revelation. They were discussing me, my worth on the black market, the profitability of trafficking in human lives, 
and the demand for young, healthy individuals. My blood ran cold as the realization dawned. Joseph had been plotting to sell me all along, to profit from my misfortune and enrich himself with tainted proceeds. The urge to confront him surged within me, to demand explanations and exact retribution for his treachery. Yet a voice of caution prevailed, a silent counsel warning of imminent peril lurking just beyond the threshold. Thus I retreated to my chamber and secured the door behind me, grappling with a maelstrom of dread and uncertainty. I deliberated my course of action, whether to contact authorities or make my escape, while opportunity still presented itself. Enshrouded in darkness, the minutes stretched into hours as I wrestled with indecision. Yet as despair threatened to engulf me, a tentative knock echoed through the wood, a sound that sent shivers coursing down my spine. Cautiously I unbolted the door, revealing Joseph standing on the other side, his countenance inscrutable as he fixed me with an intense gaze. We need to talk, he implored, his voice tinged with urgency. Please grant me a chance to elucidate. In that moment I struggled with conflicting emotions, a desire to dismiss him summarily, and an inexplicable compulsion to afford him an audience. Relenting, I permitted his entry, and as he began to speak the shards of the puzzle aligned. He disclosed his turbulent past debts incurred and misjudgments made in moments of vulnerability. He divulged the threats levied against me, the coercion employed to compel his compliance in the face of perilous ultimatums. Listening to his narrative, a wave of contrition washed over me. Remorse for misjudging him in ignorance, for presuming malevolence where desperation reigned. Yet despite his narrative, I harbored a gnawing apprehension, an awareness that we remained ensnared in jeopardy, that the malefactors he'd entangled with would cease at naught until their aims were realized. Thus we devised a strategy in hushed tones, a stratagem to extricate ourselves from the mire and commence anew, far removed from the clutches of adversity. And as we plotted our exodus, I resolved that regardless of the trials that lay ahead, we would confront them together, united in adversity, steadfast until the final reckoning. A date with the abyss, Haley. I swipe right on a seemingly ordinary Friday night. I would have never thought that it would take a dark turn. The app matched me with someone named Alex. We instantly took a liking to each other, and we spent a month texting. We finally decided to meet on a fine weekend. After a few charming exchanges, Alex and I decided to meet at her place for our first date. Her profile seemed genuine, and she looked lovely and bubbly in all her pictures. But, the vibe became uneasy the moment I walked through her front door. I was taken aback. Dark paintings, spooky masks, and an odd collection of old dolls with lifeless eyes were among the unsettling elements in the living room. I tried to brush off the initial discomfort, figuring Alex was into eccentric things. Alex's behavior grew more and more unpredictable as the evening wore on. She kept whispering about a spooky past and a family curse that afflicted her house. And then she kept staring at me with an uncomfortable intensity as I tried to refocus the conversation on safer topics. I was already feeling flustered, this wasn't what I expected to be. Alex suggested a tour of the house, and against my better judgment, I agreed. The floorboards creaked with a sorrowful tune as she guided me through dimly lit passageways filled with creepy, disturbing objects. With every step I took, my breath shortens as my uneasiness increased. The temperature dropped as soon as we entered the basement, and there was an overpowering stench. I caught a peek of a random unsettling tools in the flickering light, including corroded chains, tattered ropes, and an old leather chair that looked more at home in a torture chamber than a suburban house. Alex's expression changed, her eyes shining with a perverse enthusiasm. She revealed a secret chamber with a hidden door that, according to her, contained the key to lifting the family curse. I was terrified, but my curiosity kept me by her side. I flinched when the door cracked open, revealing a chamber full with strange symbols and a hideous altar. 
Alex's behavior grew more erratic and ultimately insane. I wasn't sure how to react, but I panicked. She described a demonic ceremony involving an old book and a sacrifice that had to be carried out. With my heart racing, I tried to excuse myself, but Alex's hold tightened, exposing a frantic strength beneath her obviously fragile facade. With a knife in her hand and an obvious look of insanity in her eyes, the situation escalated into a nightmare. I tried to struggle and fight, and in the chaos, she managed to injure me with the sharp knife. Pain surged through me as I clutched the wound, blood seeping between my fingers. Afraid and hurt, I managed to break free and stumbled back, desperately searching for an escape route through the maze-like house of horrors. The distant wail of sirens provided a glimmer of hope. I reached the front door, battered and bruised, just as the police arrived. Alex, now consumed by a frenzied desperation, was taken into custody. The ambulance rushed me to the hospital, where stitches were needed to mend the wound inflicted during that intense struggle. I discovered Alex's dark past and her family's long history of occult rituals in the days following the incident. Through the dating app that brought us together, I had unintentionally entered a nightmare and taken an unexpected journey through the corridors of madness. Haunted by the memory of that fateful night, I deleted the app, vowing never to ever use such apps. The scars, both physical and emotional, served as a terrifying reminder that sometimes, the most unsuspecting places could house the darkest secrets. The Vanishing Match Joy. On a breezy Saturday evening, I swiped right, opening the door to what I thought would be a simple coffee date. I had no idea that the virtual world would abruptly and terrifyingly crash into my reality. We arranged to meet at a nearby coffee shop after exchanging messages with Jim for a few days. His profile portrayed him as a pleasant, down-to-earth guy, and the early interactions were full of clever banter. I was giddy with anticipation as I walked into the busy cafe and looked around for Jim's familiar face from the pictures we exchanged. I told my roommate about Jim and she asked me to be careful. I assured her it was nothing to worry about. His smile was so contagious that we had no trouble chatting over steaming coffee when he arrived. I felt comfortable with Jim right away because of his charming personality, and I ended up enjoying our time together. Then he suggested we go to a hip underground bar he knew, and I enthusiastically agreed. The bar had a spooky vibe about it and was dimly lighted. Jim's demeanor changed when we took our beverages. He became increasingly possessive, insisting that we explore a secluded part of the bar away from prying eyes. He led me through a maze-like alleyway, far from the bustling ambience of the pub, and I started to feel uneasy. Out of nowhere, my mouth was covered with a towel that smelled sickeningly sweet. I felt a wave of panic as my consciousness faded. I don't know what happened then. But when I woke up, I found myself in a dimly lit room, my entire body bound to a chair. I couldn't move. The terrible truth dawned on me, I realized that I had been had fallen victim by a sick person I met on a dating app. Jim was standing in front of me his charming facade replaced by a menacing one. He relished in telling stories of his dreaded schemes. He kidnapped unsuspecting people because he was obsessed with finding the perfect bride and thought he could get married to a prefect bride in the most horrific way. Apparently, he is obsessed with skinny, pale, undernourished doll-like bride. My heart pounded in my chest as I struggled against the restraints, thinking of my awful fate that I willingly walked into. I did not know how long I was there. One hour, a few hours, or maybe a day. Two. I was too tired. Jim went on with his deranged monologue, telling me about his bizarre fantasies and what was in store for me. My blood began to race with fear as I imagined going through the slow mental and physical torture that he is about to put me in. Just as I was about to pass out, there was an abrupt noise outside the room. The door blew open, letting in the police's flashing lights. They had come to this dark den via a sting operation. 
I was surprised. I didn't notify the police. Turns out, my roommate had been worried about me and had made a police report. Jim was captured in the following chaos, and I managed to escape my captor's terrifying clutch. Initially a place to meet people, the dating app had now turned into a place to spread unspeakable cruelty. I was very thankful, if it wasn't for her, I would have been a victim to that deranged predator. I struggled to deal with the trauma of the experience thereafter, troubled by the realization that my search for companionship had put me in danger of falling victim to an insanity. The Stalker, Mary What I'm about to tell you is straight out of a nightmare. It all began like any other day in my regular life. But, little did I know, someone was keeping an eye on everything I did. Weird things started happening, things I thought were just random. Every day, on my way to work, I'd spot the same guy at the bus stop. He stood there like a statue really tall, with a hat pulled so low over his eyes that I couldn't see his face. At first, I figured he just had the same routine as me. But then, he started showing up in places I never expected, the grocery store, the park where I jog, even outside where I work. Naturally, I got a bit spooked. I mean, who wouldn't? I tried convincing myself it was all in my head, that I was being paranoid. But deep down, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. Things took a dark turn when I started receiving anonymous messages on my phone. Weird texts that hinted at things only I knew. Details about my daily routine, the color of my bedroom walls, even the pizza toppings I liked. It was like the stalker had a backstage pass to my life. I became really scared. To protect myself, I changed the locks on my doors, checked my windows three times, and started going home in different ways. But no matter what I did, it seemed like this person who was bothering me was always one step ahead. The messages they sent got even scarier, from just creepy observations to direct threats. It felt like I was the prey, and no matter where I went or what I tried, the stalker was always there, hiding in the shadows, like a constant, creepy presence. It happened one scary night. I was sitting there, watching TV, when suddenly, all the lights went out. It got really, really dark, and this creepy feeling crawled up my back. And then, out of nowhere, I heard it, a whisper, so quiet but definitely there. It was the stalker's voice, right outside my window, saying really unsettling things. I couldn't move, fear had me stuck in place. That's when it hit me, this wasn't just some random person, it was a predator who had invaded my life, and I was trapped in the darkness with them. Terrified, I called the police. They searched the area, but the stalker was like a phantom, leaving no trace behind. I couldn't sleep that night, haunted by the whispers. I knew I had to be vigilant, but I was going insane. Day by day, the stalker's tactics became more invasive. They started sending letters, handwritten, no return address. The words on the pages were a twisted mix of obsession and hatred. They knew about my childhood, my friends, even my deepest fears. It was as if this person had dug into the very core of my being. I set up cameras around my house, trying to see who the stalker was. But every time I checked the recordings, there was nothing, just quiet streets and empty nights. I felt really hopeless, like the stalker knew how to stay hidden, playing a twisted game of cat and mouse with me. They were always one step ahead, and it made the situation even scarier. Things got really bad. The stalker took it to a whole new level, they started wrecking my stuff. One day. I found my car scratched with creepy messages, and another day, my front door was covered in weird, disturbing symbols. It was like I couldn't escape, my own life felt like a prison. I couldn't relax, I always had to watch my back, 
waiting for the next scary thing the stalker would do. The police were sympathetic, but their hands were tied. Without concrete evidence, there was little they could do. I was devastated. My life was a wreck. I became a detective in my own nightmare, trying to piece together the puzzle of my stalker's identity. My friends urged me to move, change my name, start fresh, but I couldn't shake the feeling that the stalker would follow me, no matter where I went. One day, as I was scrolling through my social media, I noticed a new friend request, a profile with no photos, no mutual friends, just a blank slate. I knew who it was. Against my better judgment, I accepted, hoping to get a glimpse of the person who had turned my life upside down. The stalker wasted no time. Messages flooded my inbox, each one more sinister and disturbing than the last. They described my every move, my thoughts, my nightmares. It was like the stalker had become a puppet master, pulling the strings of my life with a sadistic pleasure. I deleted my social media, changed my number, and went off the grid. But the messages kept coming, finding new ways to pierce through my walls of isolation. It felt like the stalker was a shadow, always there, lurking just out of sight. I was really, really desperate by now. I decided to get a private investigator, someone who could figure out who was tormenting me. But the stalker was like a ghost, the investigator couldn't find any clues, no digital hints, nothing to follow. It felt like the stalker was this invisible presence, haunting me from the shadows, making the whole situation even scarier than ever. One night, I couldn't take it anymore. I sent the stalker an email, pouring out all my fear, anger, and confusion, begging them to tell me why they were tormenting me. I was shocked when they actually responded. But what they said was twisted and disturbing, like a sick confession that made everything even scarier. The stalker said they used to be in my class back in high school, but honestly, I barely remembered them. It turned out they held a serious grudge, like this twisted obsession that grew over the years. The stuff they told me was like they rewrote our shared history in their messed up head, making everything seem creepy and distorted. It shocked me and made me really disgusted. I took the evidence to the police, and they finally had a lead. After what felt like an eternity, they finally caught the stalker. But the nightmare didn't stop there. The court hearings were really traumatizing. The stalker kept staring at me with eyes full of hate and satisfaction. Every moment in that courtroom felt uncomfortable and painful, like the nightmare was still going on. In the end, the judge issued a restraining order, but by then, the fear had already settled in. It was too late. I wasn't the same person anymore, I felt broken. Even though the stalker was behind bars, I couldn't get rid of the feeling that their presence was still hanging over me. It took years of countless therapy sessions, countless sleepless nights, and a constant battle with paranoia to start feeling kind of normal again. The fear just wouldn't let go, ever. So, there I was, a college student taking on a part-time gig at a charming little flower shop just in time for Valentine's Day. Seemed like a sweet deal, arranging bouquets, helping customers pick out the perfect roses, you know, spreading the love. Little did I know, that Valentine's Day was about to take a dark turn. The day started like any other, with the sweet scent of flowers filling the air and lovey-dovey couples pouring into the shop. I was busy arranging a beautiful bouquet when I noticed an old man shuffling towards the counter. He had this eerie look in his eyes, like he carried the weight of a lifetime of heartbreak. He handed me a crumpled note, a request for a special bouquet. The note was written in shaky handwriting, detailing the flowers and their arrangement. It was a bit odd, but hey, it was Valentine's Day, and people get sentimental, right? I set to work, carefully crafting the bouquet exactly as the note instructed. Red roses, white lilies, and black calla lilies, an unusual combination, but who am I to judge? As I finished, the old man's eyes seemed to glint with an unsettling satisfaction. 
Night fell, and the shop closed its doors, leaving me alone with the bouquet in the ominous note. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off about those black calla lilies, the dark beauty casting a shadow over the cheerfulness of the other flowers. I decided to call it a day, locking up the shop and heading home. But as I stepped outside, the wind carried an eerie whisper, like a soft voice muttering incomprehensible words. I shook it off, telling myself it was just the wind playing tricks. The next morning, the news hit like a ton of bricks. A couple, the recipients of the mysterious bouquet, had been found lifeless in their home. The black calla lilies, it turned out, were not just flowers. They were known for their toxic properties. The police questioned me about the old man, but he was nowhere to be found. The shop, once a haven of blossoming romance, now carried an air of tragedy. Valentine's Day, meant to be a celebration of love, had taken a dark turn, leaving a trail of death and mystery. I couldn't shake the guilt, wondering if I could have somehow known that the request was more than just a harmless gesture. The flower shop became a haunting reminder of the unexpected darkness that lurked beneath the surface of seemingly ordinary days. In the end, I left the part-time job. Valentine's Admirer Lane Last Valentine's Day was something out of a nightmare, and I can't shake off that memory. It all began innocently enough, a mysterious Valentine's Day card with no return address, just a blood-red envelope sealed with a heart. I took a look at it nervously, thinking it was some dark humor from a friend. However, I had no idea that it would be the beginning of a terrifying experience. As I opened the ominous card, the message inside gave me goosebumps. I've been watching you, and tonight, you'll be mine. I was filled with dread as the words appeared to pop off the page. It was more akin to a sentence from a horror film than the typical Valentine's Day message. Trying to play it cool, I dismissed it as a prank and decided to go out for a simple dinner with my significant other. The restaurant had a charming vibe thanks to its numerous heart-shaped decorations. Warm glows from softly muted lights created an intimate atmosphere that seemed to envelop every table. Engaged in a world where every detail spoke of love and connection, couples were immersed in the beautiful settings. I tried to enjoy the romantic evening, but the unsettling feeling of being watched persisted. When I returned home, the atmosphere in my apartment had transformed. What was once warm and familiar now felt cold and unsettling. Every sound echoed in the emptiness of the space. I couldn't shake the feeling that someone was lurking in the shadows, observing my every move. Determined not to let paranoia ruin the night, I tried to distract myself with a movie. With a press of the remote control, I navigated through the TV channels, scrolling through an array of movie options. The screen flickered, presenting a tempting lineup. Most seemed boring, yet I scrolled through to find something that will make me feel better. Yet, even the comforting glow of the screen couldn't dispel the unease. The clock ticked closer to midnight, and that's when things took a turn for the worse. Out of the blue, my phone rang with an unknown number flashing on the screen. Hesitant but curious, I answered, only to be met with eerie silence at first. Then, a raspy voice whispered, I told you, tonight you'll be mine. Panic set in, and I slammed the phone down, my mind racing with fear and confusion. As if on cue, the lights in my apartment flickered, casting eerie shadows on the walls. I fumbled for my phone, using its flashlight to navigate the now ominous space. That's when I saw it, a message scrawled on the living room wall in what looked like blood. Happy Valentine's Day, my love. The words seemed to ridicule me and it dawned on me that this was something much darker than a practical joke. I started to panic, and I knew I had to get out of there. I hastily packed a bag, leaving behind the unnerving message on the wall, and fled my own apartment. The following days were a blur of fear and paranoia. I couldn't shake off the feeling that someone was watching me, following my every move. The once-beloved holiday of love now filled me with dread and every approaching February 14th was a haunting reminder of that twisted Valentine's Day. Months passed, and the fear began to subside. 
I tried my best to convince myself that it was just a sick joke or a random act of insanity. But deep down, the unanswered questions lingered, who had sent that card, and why? Was it a disgruntled ex-lover, a deranged stranger, or someone with a more sinister motive? I decided to involve the authorities. I reported the incident, shared the unsettling details, and hoped they could uncover the identity of the person behind that nightmarish Valentine's Day. The investigation, however, yielded little progress. No fingerprints, no leads, just a lingering sense of vulnerability. Valentine's Day came around again, and I couldn't escape the memories. The sight of heart-shaped decorations and romantic gestures triggered anxiety, and I found myself constantly looking over my shoulder. The experience had left scars on my psyche, and love, once a source of joy, had become entwined with fear. If you found any enjoyment in the video, I implore you to click that like button and subscribe if you dare.